Yo, BJ Gador with the BJ Gador podcast and Jeremy Scott here with the Jeremy Scott Fitness Podcast, a radio show. So we have the two most original names in the podcast game. <laughs> yes. This is going to be a great episode, guys. Look, we're going to call this like the best and worst of 2023 or basically a year in review. We're going to be talking the NBA in-season tournament. What a smash and success. Go let show. And we're also going to be talking top movies of the year, top TV and docs of the year. And uh, Jeremy also took some questions from people on Instagram because I turned off comments for mental health. What do we got coming through that? Uh, yeah, just the stuff that you guys sent in. We'll uh, we'll touch on Ozempic because obviously that's everybody and their brother is either thinking about it, taking it, or looking at it. And then uh, our biggest regrets on the fitness journey and a handful of other things along the way. You know what? This is like a uh, a fitness version of, of Festivus too. So we're gonna air some grievances. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna give Cole uh, as part. This is like an annual tradition. We're just gonna give Cole to Peloton every year. Big fitness, bro. Big fitness for the rich. I did see uh, Dana White like did a thing where I don't know what it was, but like he yanked all the Pelotons out of all their studios because something happened where he's just like. Or no, I think that's what it was. They they must have pulled ads or something from uh, maybe it was uh, RFK Junior or something. Like they weren't gonna, they didn't want to do ads on a show he was on or something. And Dana White's like, "Fuck that!" and yanks all the Pelotons out of all the UFC shit. Like within a week, they're gone. No, I, you, so you sent me that clip. He was on the Theo Vaughn podcast, which, by the way, like year in review, uh, I saw uh, Theo Vaughn's uh, stand up, and again, like you know, uh, the. the Half of my family is, I've, I've come from white trash. We're both from the Midwest. So I really do like his brand of comedy. And he's one of those guys, like, he's able to talk about some stuff that, uh, you know, might cause a lot of controversy with other people or would get him canceled. But when you're, when you're really funny, when you're like a naturally gifted comedian, you know, you can talk about things that nobody else can. You really do, it's, it's a skill, it's an art form. Um, but Dana was on his show. And Theo was talking about how like uh, people got upset about something with RFK, and then like I guess Peloton pulled all their ads from his show, and then Dana White went on this rant about you know stationary bikes and you know uh, fuck Peloton, which is by the way I was the first one to start saying that years I ago. Did. I, I did a whole podcast entitled that, and iTunes uh, like penalized me because you're not supposed to have a swear in the title. Well, I did see. We have the last podcast you did with, uh, I think, Justin Yule at the very end. You give Peloton a little uh, shout out at the very end of the, the message. I always will. Because, again, like to me, like, I, I said on the podcast, I know you feel the same way. Uh, it's just like everything that's wrong with fitness. Like it's to me, <laughs> we're going to get into a lot of great stuff today, but we're on it. So might as well talk about it. Like remember when you're growing up and they would be like around this time of year, Christmas, December to remember all these cars like men are buy, gifting their wife a car for Christmas. I'm like, wow, what, what a life where like you can give a car as a Christmas gift. That wasn't my Christmas experience. No, and well, and now that I'm an adult, like obviously there's no way, well, my parents were not married, so that was never gonna happen anyway. But even if they were, like my dad wasn't gonna just show up with a car. And even if it was me today and like, can, like a second buy Heather a car, what kind of psychopath do you have to be where you just go and make this monster financial commitment without like notifying your partner about, Hey, I'm going to go drop 50 to a hundred thousand dollars on a car, put a bow on it and then drive it up to the house and be like, hope you like it. Like that's like some psychopath stuff, man. And, and by the way, these were like, these weren't like Ford escorts. These were Lexus, like premium luxury vehicles. But to me, it's like, cause you see the Peloton ads coming out right now. It's like, this some rich guy in his Manhattan sky rise, you know, with a, you know, several thousand dollar bike, like, you know, it's, it's all about celebrity and, and wealth. And I just, it's everything I hate about fucking fitness, man. It's ever it literally is the symbol of it. And we're going to unpack a lot of that stuff today um, as well. And again, like, you know, we, we both come from nothing. We built a beautiful life for ourselves, but like, we're not rich people. We'll never be like we're just not like those types of people um and we don't like you know positioning fitness in that way because fitness fitness is for everyone physical culture and education is for everyone it's not just for the elite 
No, I mean, if you love it, if you love a Peloton or whatever kind of bike, like that's cool. But I don't, that, that to me is the one that sticks out the most because it, it's a bicycle. There's really nothing different other than you stuck a screen on it. And it's not a great bike of all the bikes you could buy. I mean, I'm not saying you have to get an assault bike, but that thing will cost you about 900 bucks. You can beat the hell out of it. Most of you, your entire life. And it is a hundred X the workout that you would ever get. Now, is it as fun? No, it's way more efficient, but you could get an erg bike or you could buy, I don't know, a real bike for like 200 bucks and just ride around your neighborhood. Like there's so many other things I'd rather do than sit all day and then sit again on a bike and shorten my hip flexors and TFL and so as, and cause myself this unwanted lower back pain and follow along to somebody on a screen. Again, if you love it, cool. I just don't, I just think it's really overpriced and it, I, I don't understand how it's even still going. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, what's going to happen. Like th this is, this is uh, we, we've seen this. How many times do we have to see this? And they've already ex experienced the, the, the oversupplied, the initial demand from the pandemic. So they have like all these bikes that no one wants. And uh, you know, the stockholders will, will see the writing on the wall and they'll get out and, eventually they'll, they'll sell it before like things get bad and everyone is stuck with a stupid bike that's just going to be a clothes hanger a glorified clothes hanger but anyway people want to keep doing it that's fine but like you said like an assault bike such a better investment a, a full body workout um and i say you know, obviously they say oh you can come off the bike and we have a treadmill now too and it's just like but you're not teaching people anything you know what i mean like you're not there's no empowerment you know, this is just, it's just, it's like, it's, it's celebrity. It's all about celebrity and like getting these personal trainers that are like, you see the ads are like, everyone's dancing. Have, I'm not against dancing. Okay. But like, you know, it's like, they because they know like everyone they're marketing to like everyone, there's everyone hates exercise. So we have to pretend like it's so much fun and, and we're dancing. And this is, you know, it's like, no, if, if that's what it's going to take. Like if you need someone to kind of dance you through a workout, you know, you, you're going about it the wrong way and it's, it's just not going to be it's not for you it's not going to be sustainable if you have to find a way like you hate it so much that you have to like dance through it i'm not saying have don't have fun in your workouts but i don't know man like i i i'm so sick of peloton i'm so sick, sick of seeing their ads everywhere and uh you know it's just a peloton is, is is like the fitness equivalent of taylor swift i just can't get away from it i can't get away from it it's got to be on the tail end, though. It's oh yeah. It's got to be. It's got to be coming close. There's no way people can't even afford McDonald's right now. So let's let's start by talking about you know obviously we're we're, uh, we're big NBA fans, big basketball fans. We we did a earlier this year we did a kind of a, a season preview of the NBA as well for those who want to check that out. But wow, this tournament was something else, man. Like uh, there there are so many things that like to unpack. Um, LeBron James doing what he he did at 39, like literally running these young guys off the court. I, I, I by the way, like, and I'm joking now, but like, is he on growth hormone? Like, what's going on? Like, he turned the clock back. I haven't seen LeBron run down the court like that. Uh, it's been a while. Maybe Miami. Like, he was literally just. I mean, he's, he looked like Marshawn Lynch out there, like fullback style, just punneling people. Uh, AD had that incredible performance last night. AD is on the way. Um, I want to talk about the, the brilliant marketing of the courts, the jerseys. Obviously, a lot of people hated that, but people wouldn't stop talking about it. That got people to kind of check it out and stop and see what's going on. Um, I will say that the messaging was was bad. Like there was like uh, I was watching NBA today, and Richard Jefferson is like for 90 seconds trying to explain the in-season tournament. I'm like, <laughs> like this might be because I'm 41. I'm like, he lost me like 10 seconds in. All you got to say, this is March madness in December. That's all you had to say. Win and you keep going. All right. Except now these are pros. These aren't amateurs. We're going to literally now, um, you know, see the best in the world, one and done bracket style. But they, they tried to make this like such, and then he gets a point over differential. There's a tie break. It's like, no, no, bad messaging. If you can't explain it in three to five seconds, and then the last point I'll say, I wanted to see like what are your thoughts on how to improve it. But like, I think the only the only thing I feel like it's truly missing is the winner of this should get a guaranteed sixth seed. They should lock in the sixth seed. 
Like if you, if you know that in this tournament, if you win, you've got a guaranteed six seed playoff spot. Now they, they, they're still incentive that based on your record, if your record was high enough, you could climb up to the, you know, to as high as the one seed, but no matter what you've got the six. And I mean, to me, the stakes, that's a level of stakes that could take as competitive as it was. No one's going to like everyone right now is like discounting. Oh, it's it's the NBA gifting LeBron another championship, a fake ring, just like the fake bubble championship. You know, you know but like if the Pacers would have won, all you would have been hearing how is like this is exactly what the NBA needs. So I want to talk about that, too. But uh, talk to me about like what you thought about this tournament, what, what you can see that can be improved. And what, what do you think about like that guaranteed six seed? Like some could say play in. But to me, it's like, no, play in like you can lose one and done like if this is really as big as you want to make it um i feel like that is the type of incentive that could just take this to a whole new level ongoing well it was weird because like at first i'm like i don't understand like what's the like what's the point of it and then you start to see how they put it together and you're like oh it's money it's a it's a business move um and a smart one i mean because most normal nba games during december i don't give a shit about and i didn't care about all of these but you could tell it was different like the the atmospheres just and the, obviously the courts are you know they're little diff, they're some of them are cool some are different my wife was like what the fuck is going on here when you look at them but i'm like you could just tell it was not a normal type thing and then like last night's game was cool to watch so i get why they did it from a, a monetary standpoint uh and a business standpoint i'm sure the viewership was crazy and the sponsors and the things that they can do and it seemed like the players like give a shit especially the dudes i do think having it be more than just the money now obviously you know like lebron will joke like oh it's five hundred thousand dollars to him it's like five bucks but for some of those dudes it's like almost double their salary because a lot of those guys like the younger dudes are making 800k a year 900k a year give or take so that is and for the coaches too like if you're a coach and you get a couple hundred g's and i think even the losers got like two hundred thousand or something which is actually pretty cool but if there was something more at stake, it would be, I think it would make it even more competitive. The only problem would be, it's kind of like the NCAA where Florida State's undefeated, but their quarterback's out. So they're like, fuck you guys, Alabama gets in. You know, right or wrong, it's a business though. Cause you're like, now Florida State's not as great. So if you guarantee like, hey, the Lakers win, they get the six seed, but now like LeBron's hurt or something, or Anthony Davis is hurt, it's like, well, you're not the same team, but that's, you know, a freak thing anyway. But I do think a guaranteed playoff spot, you'd get dudes to try a lot harder. Well, and the thing is too, like, you know, the argument will be, well, then they can just coast the rest of the year. But again, that that's, I mean, a, a team with uh, some older athletes, like, I mean, AD is only 30, but like LeBron, for example, you know, then they don't have to play them on back-to-backs, you know, which by the way, sh they, there should never be back-to-backs be back -to -backs in the NBA. It's, it's bad for the players. It's, I think it's just bad for business in general, but that, that's a separate discussion. But the thing is, though, teams don't want to be limping into the playoffs. They, don't, they want to be playing well at the right time in mid-April to end of April to kind of come into May. So, um, you know, they're still incentivized to climb up the rankings. You want to get home court. No one wants to play Denver four times in a seven-game series. No one wants to go up into that elevation and be out of gas for the first half of the game or the, the first two games in particular, trying to adapt to the elevation. So um, I, I just feel like it would really just um, – and by the way, like there's something to be said for being the best team to start the season and to end the season. I, I, I love that concept. Um, you know, and, I, you know, I think there's extra – like if you win both, I mean, there's no doubt you're the best team that year. You yeah, know, that would be cool. And, again, like it's not like the sixth seed is a one seed. So it's like I don't think that's a – you know to say oh now we're going to coast the rest of the year i'm like if you're good enough like you don't want to be the six seed for sure i mean obviously you'll take it but the only thing i thought was weird was they like were popping champagne and making it be like you won a an nba championship because i'm looking at them like it's cool but i'm like it's the games are cool because they're competitive and it's like kind of fun but i'm like i'd like again i always go back to and i think i'm happy for lebron like what he's doing is it's it's insane to watch like even if you're like you don't like lebron you can't just sit there and be like this is not the most unreal shit you've ever seen some old ass dude do like it's just wild to watch 
But I do think like if you were if this was Kobe, right? Like they won. Like is Kobe smiling? Like give me the trophy? No. Kobe's like fuck this. I'm back in the locker room or like or Jordan, you know. Like they're just again yeah, their personality's different. LeBron's more fun. He's that kind of guy. And so people will knock him for this. Like, oh, he's celebrating, you know, Kobe and Jordan wouldn't do that. I'm like, yeah, but they're pricks and they don't celebrate anything other than winning at all. So it is, well, it's weird to see him do that. But um, like watching him play though, like it's unbelievable, dude. It's like almost like he's like it, at moments, like still, he's not prime him, but it's the level he's playing at is unreal. Well, but the thing is like, he, he definitely isn't, uh, well, it's almost like I think what's so great about it, it's been a transformation. Like he was – there was a time, at like those Miami days, like he was so – he would literally outrun everyone down the floor. Now he he, he won't necessarily outrun people, but, again, he just – like I, I give the Marshawn Lynch analogy. Like he's just going – he's just going straight to the basket and he's just bouncing off people and um, you can't, just can't do anything about it. Like still, and if anything, it's like – he couldn't do that 10 years ago. He couldn't just like run through people. He could jump over them. He could outrun them, but he like, he's just so big and strong right now. And he, he knows how to use his body in such a way that like, I don't know. So it's been really cool to watch. And obviously his three point game has been elevated. Like he, he remember that streak against uh, the Pelicans where he just made three, 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 three straight threes. Uh, one by the logo. Like, I mean, he, he, he made Zion. Uh, he embarrassed. He embarrassed Zion. Like Zion was, besides Wemby, no one else has come into this league was as much hype as Zion. And you see a guy at 23, like jogging out there, just showing up, casual about it. And uh, I, I know you say like Jordan Kobe would not have been as uh, you know celebrating this. And again, here's the guy wearing the LeBron jersey. Um, but I'm, I'm not like I'm not like a stan. I, I mean, I I grew up an MJ fan. Um, I respect Kobe a lot, but. The reality is Adam Silver and the NBA needed to make this work. They got a big TV deal coming up. You've already – the writing's on the wall, too, for a lot of these guys. Mark Cuban sells ownership. MJ sells ownership. These guys, these they feel like this is the the perfect time to exit because they, they're not sure what the next TV deal is going to look like. Streaming and networks, that I mean, they're, they're struggling like crazy right now. HBO Max, Netflix, all these places, ESPN. So um, they needed to make this work. Now – it's the same thing. Like when David Stern needed to make something work, right? They got the top players to buy in. They got MJ to buy into the dream team. Everyone else joins. So if, if this was like 20 years ago and David Stern wanted to make the end season tournament work, uh, he would have gotten Michael Jordan to buy in. And Michael Jordan is a showman. Maybe LeBron would LeBron have been celebrating as much if he didn't know like the NBA needed this to work for its future. Again, like, I think a lot of it is just you hate him. He beat he's beating your team all these years. But at some point, it's like the hate just becomes respect. To be doing this in the 21st season, averaging three or four times points per game of the closest people that have been there before, guys like Kevin Garnett, greats in the game to play at this age. Um, it's pretty crazy. And it, it's also, again, as you're 40, I'm 41, like you love to see it. You love to see an old guy come and beat the shit out of these young kids. Well, and like Zion too, like not to bag on him, but like he doesn't look like he's in shape, you know, like he doesn't look like, I mean, not that he's out of shape, but he just doesn't seem like he's at his peak, you know, physical condition and he's a younger dude in his 20s. And then you get LeBron, who's, you know, could be his dad coming in and just like steamrolling him and everybody else. And like Le the LeBron thing, it's, he's almost like the Patriots, like, you know, people will hate the Patriots because they were just so good for so long. And then when they lose, you're like, oh, okay, cool. Like, they can lose. Like, LeBron basically is that. It's like this dude is – I think that Rick Carlisle said this. He was he was the youngest guy in the league, and now he's the oldest guy in the league. Like, he's the only dude who's been like both, who's been the youngest guy and the oldest guy. And he's been awesome the whole time. Like, I think the first year Kobe was in the league – he came off the bench. He averaged like six, seven points a game. Eddie Jones is starting over him. Um, and I think, I don't know who said this the other day. Maybe it was uh, Stack or somebody. He's like, dude, Eddie Jones is not starting over LeBron. Like when LeBron's in 10th grade, LeBron's like going to be starting. And like, I don't know if that's true or not, but 
Like LeBron comes into the league at year one and averages over 20 points a game. And it's never looked back since, which is fucking wild, man. No, man, it's crazy. And, you know, ultimately, too, like <clears throat> winning half a million dollars, like there's two guys in the Lakers. That's a that's literally a 50 percent increase in their salary. Can you like, can you imagine if they came to you and me like, hey, we need you to make a DVD. And if it's really good or it's the best DVD in a competition, a workout DVD, again, whatever it is, like whatever our lame asses would do in comparison. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, just we're just former athletes that are just trying to find a way to, to make a living here, um, doing what we love. But, um, I mean, what I'm just thinking of like how much I would get up for, like, I got paid $10,000 to make speed shred. Okay. Like now that's, that, that's, that's no joke amount of money. Like I'd still get up for something like that, but like in comparison, like knowing how much money it made, how many people it reached 500 K would have been a lot more, I think reasonable in my opinion in terms of compensation. But um, can, you, can you imagine like how exciting that would be to get up for that? And again, like these guys, uh, LeBron's a billionaire because he's not scoffing. He never scoffs at $500,000. A lot of people, you know, when you don't have money and I've been there when I started to start to make some money, like you have no appreciation for, for, for how to manage it. Um, you want to spend it. You don't think about, you know, long-term stuff like that. Um, and that's why a lot of these guys have been going broke. But there's a reason he's become a billionaire still playing. Because any amount of money is not something to scoff at. No, especially if someone came to me and said, hey, we're going to double your what you make in a year. Do you know how hard I would try, bro? Like, even if it wasn't that, if they said, hey, man, come here tomorrow morning. If you're on time and you do your normal job, we're going to give you $5,000 for being here all day tomorrow. I'll be like, Fuck yeah, dude. Like, I'll be on time. Even if it's not, like, this insane number. But for those dudes, you know jack they are? Like, the, you've never seen benches cheer so hard. Because they're like, hey, man, if we win, dude, I'm going to go from making 480 a year to a million dollars. Like, that is wild stuff. And you can just put it away for 20 years and be set. That's what Max Christie said he's going to do. Uh, one of their uh, young players who really, you know, has a lot of potential. 3 and D. He's got a nice, clean shot. Uh, incredible defensive like honestly like um this team that again it's it's anything can happen in the finals if anything like the in-season tournament favors a team like the Pacers a young team that could just shoot the lights out any given night um so I, I you know where I think the Lakers are actually better suited to a seven game series because again like when, it, when you're playing against a young team you figure them out and then it's just all mental and that's that's where LeBron LeBron's going to figure out how to win a seven game series if healthy, I still say, man, like he had a torn tendon in his foot last year against Denver. And that was, that ended up being the, uh, the I know it was a sweep, but it was the smallest point differential, uh, I think, ever in a, in a sweep before. Because those games came down to a couple shots, a um, couple of possessions at the end of each game against who still is the best player in the game, Jokic. But um, Cam Reddish, bro, like, I, honestly, I think he, he won't get it, but I think he has the potential to be the most improved player of the year. I, his defense is elite. You got a seven foot one wingspan, and you got a guy that was like the guy in college that can just focus on shutting down the best player. And then you have Vando that can come in, and it's it's like to me, it's like uh, an all time defensive tag team. They, they switch out every five minutes, just come in. So, you know, I don't know if they're going to be considered the championship favorites now, but. Obviously, everything ties into LeBron and AD's health. But again, if they had a guaranteed playoff spot at six seed, um, you know, I, I feel like that could make this uh, potentially the most interesting part of of the year. Um, because again, like, just to know you had that locked in, the decisions you can make, and then by the way, you got the trade deadlines coming up, and you you you've seen how your players either rise up or fall to the level of that intense like playoff style competition. So now you know like what your lineups might look like, who you might want to keep or who you might need to trade. So I just feel like um, it's such a cool way to uh, set the stage at the quarter point of the season. I don't know. like, And I know people were, were, were complaining about the courts. And again, typically it's guys our age and older that just hate anything new. But um, I, I liked all of it. I, I just thought it was, uh, again, like you said, this is, a, this is such a smart business decision. This is literally the – the lowest rating, least revenue uh, part of the season for this business model. 
and they just found a way to inject so much energy, excitement, and, and frankly, revenue into it. And I, so I don't know, I, I just, I take a lot from it as an entrepreneur or just, you know, you think about the down times of our business, like the summer, right? People are traveling and, you know, um, what can we do to infuse a little, I know you do it all the time, you know, a, a quick 28 day challenge or stuff like that. But there, there are a lot of lessons. I don't know. What do you take from it uh, with, with, what, with how you approach things? Yeah, I mean, it's it's literally we do the same thing and we've kind of always done it to generate, you know, whether it's revenue or just interest in getting people who typically are, you know, if it's the NBA, right, like they're around the game and I might watch a game here or there, but I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have watched a game last night, I don't think. I really wouldn't, if it was just the Pacers and the Lakers were playing last night, maybe I would have turned it on, but I probably would have watched a movie or done something different because I'm like, I don't really care. But I'm like, well, it's the, it's the championship and then. Obviously, I watched the Lakers and the Pelicans, and then I obviously watched, you know, the Pacers and the Celtics. So I'm watching the stuff before. So, like, for me, every game, do I care? No, but, like, it's a quote-unquote tournament. So it got me to watch probably three or four extra games at least that I wouldn't have watched. And if I was com to compare it to something else, like, the All-Star weekend sucks to me. Um, I As a kid, I thought they tried more. Uh, and I, it was kind of cool to watch because you would see dudes um, – you know, like when it's, I'm talking like, you know, in my opinion, the golden era. So it's like Jordan, David Robinson, Magic, Bird, even like Shaq, when Kobe and Jordan in those games, like they would try, like they would actually like kind of play a real game for the most part. And now it's just, it's a complete shit show. Nobody plays defense at all. It's like, it's terrible to watch. And then the dunk contest has sucked in my opinion, for the most part. Now, there's some one-off stuff, but it's not great. The three-point contest is the only thing I think that's kind of cool. But again, it really only works if the stars do it. You know, it's like the – I remember watching this Larry Bird interview where he's like, yeah, I'm in the three-point contest, and I guess I'm kind of nervous because all these guys are bench players. Like, I'm the only guy who's, like, the man. And he, obviously, in his Larry Bird fashion. But once I hit a couple shots, like, I knew I was going to win, obviously, like, because he's just a complete shit talker. And I remember some of those would be fun, and some of, the th like, the three-point contests – are okay but the rest of all-star weekend i think is trash i think this is way better than that is in terms of generating interest i don't know in terms of revenue like how it does but i again the skills competition i couldn't tell you if i've ever watched one like it's garbage to me well you know it's also i mean like think about the pacers man this was this was like their first national national games of the year they had to beat philly boston and milwaukee to get to this final so they're no joke. I mean, they, they are no joke. I don't think anyone wants to go against the Pacers at any point during the season. Um, and it's, it's a great opportunity for a team that never gets any sort of spotlight <clears throat> that, you know, maybe is not equipped for a seven game series, but any given night, you know, NFL style, March Madness style, they can shoot the lights out and run you out the building with points. So um, I, I thought it was great for that young team. And, and obviously Halliburton is, is just exploded onto the scene. So um I don't know. I just I feel like it was. It's great for the league. It, it's a lot of fun, um, and uh, I, I really I feel like that additional stake could make this potentially the most exciting. Because you know these seven game series, like they they, uh, I mean, it's a lot of games. Like you're like you're. It, it's a marathon, you know. Um, so I, I just I, I really like the. I just I loved it, and uh, I'm excited to see. Um, you know, what comes from it. Do, do you have any, has it changed your mind at all about who you think is going to win the championship or, or uh, what are your thoughts there? Uh, it's tough. Cause I try not to do the, you know, recency bias, which sure. most people tend to do like, Oh, you know, like we forget guys who played before, right? Like, Oh, we don't talk about Iverson. Like he just doesn't exist anymore. Like all of a sudden, like Kyrie's the greatest thing ever. I'm like, do you remember Allen Iverson, bro? Like, and I'm not trying to not Kyrie. But we'll talk about, like, I, I think it was watching, like, uh, Arenas talking about this. They're like, who's the harder person to guard, Kyrie or Iverson? And, like, without a hesitation, he goes, Iverson. Well, some people say Kyrie this and this. He goes, yeah, because they never guarded Iverson, bro. He goes, I'm not even talking. He goes, one guy's trying to kill you. One guy's, like, going to get buckets in, like, these fancy ways. But one guy's trying to give you 50 every single night. He goes, it's just exhausting. My point is, is, like, we'll forget about stuff that, isn't happening right now. The Lakers do look really good, but I do I think they're the favorite? Like, no, I don't think they are. Um, 
but they do look good, man. Like I watching them makes me think they're better than I guess I thought they were. And to your point, I never would watch the Pacers. They're not on TV. I mean, I we get a lot of the channels here, but honestly, even watching NBA TV, sometimes the the commentating is so bad. Uh, it, as weird as it is, like it makes a difference. Like if it's Mike Breen doing a game, or it's I think the other day it was somebody in Brian Scalabrini, and he's he's a cool dude. Like he seems fine. But some of the shit I just listen again, I'm an old, angry man. Like some of the stuff I just say, he's like, How can Derek White, like, how can they call him a role player? I'm like, dude, he he is a role player. Like, very few dudes are superstars and like main players. And I'm like, and I'm just listening to them like have these pauses and not talk during the plays and like they really don't know what to say. And I'm like, Yeah, man, this is not this is not great. So like I'm picky at the games I watch. And so I'm not gonna seek out a fucking Pacers game, but I'm watching like the Halberton kid is really good. Um, he does take some really, really bad shots, like some really awful off the dribble threes that are so far away and air balls them by a good like two feet. I'm like, which I give him credit, like he doesn't give a shit, which is a different skill. But to your point, like I wouldn't watch the Pacers, I wouldn't know anything about him or see him. So it does bring that. I do think the Lakers are better. Um, but I don't – it's tough, too, because, like, the Timberwolves have the best record. And it's like, well, that's not really – you know, they do, but are they the best team? Like, no, I have no faith in the Timberwolves whatsoever. Oh, I mean, look, it's it's going to go through Denver. There's just no doubt about it. Um, you you, you want to win this championship, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be going through Denver in the West. But um, I definitely think uh, the offseason work that the Lakers put in the front office, uh, we, we saw what's possible. And then the other piece of it, too, you were mentioning the, the commentating. Did you see? So my wife accidentally recorded, instead of the ABC version of the, the game, she recorded the ESPN, which had basically was an unplugged Kevin Hart. Oh, oh when, I start, when, when I started, when I started, when I started, the, uh, I was home, I dropped Heather off, I come back, and like that was what was on. And I'm like, it was like six, it was a little bit after 6.30 that they actually tipped it. And I'm watching, it's like Kevin Hart and his friends. And I'm like, what is this? I, I thought it was literally like that's how they were going to show the game. And I'm like, this is actually like terrible to watch. And then finally I, I found that like right at tip off, I found the real edition. But yeah, that was, um, there's zero chance. Like I will say like if it's football, I've watched some of the Manning cast stuff, uh, which is actually kind of funny. Um, those two dudes riffing back and forth. But I don't want to watch a whole game like that and no offense to kevin hart like he's funny but uh that was a terrible uh five minutes of my life dude that was that was the worst broadcast i've ever seen and i, I got i got put in there by the way the difference between the mannings and kevin hart is the mannings are football legends they can actually speak to what's going on out there all kevin hart was doing he was just making fun of uh the way anthony davis looks calling him bug-eyed uh new bends <laughs> i mean like it's like no one it was so bad because I, I like to typically watch on replay so that I can cut through most of the commercials and then get live for the fourth quarter so that no updates come through on my phone that tell me what happened. So we went out to dinner quick, came back, and then I realized, oh, my God, like I got I to gotta watch this to get to the third quarter right now. So And I never do this, but it was so bad. Even my wife was just a ca – she's a casual <laughs> or at best uh, in terms of you know watching this stuff. But – it was so bad listening to it. I, I, I couldn't follow the game. And uh, I, I like to, like, I don't watch the game typically with, with people. It just I like to, I love to just, like, completely immerse myself in it. Um, I, I said, you know, fuck it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to miss the first three and a half quarters, get live so I don't have to deal with this. And I never do that. That's how, that's how bad that was. But, you know, I know ESPN is, is desperate. They're struggling. They're trying to find any which way to get people to, to kind of stay tuned, I guess. But um, I guess that that's something that I'd love to see thrown away, never done again, because uh, I mean, I just, I just could not do it. I, I was getting physically ill um, and I, I have a hyper focus thing. So like I, it was such a distraction. I, I just could not, I'm watching the game, but I, I can't figure out what's going on because it was so, it was so bad. And again, I wish I, I'm so happy for Kevin Hart's success. Okay. Kevin Hart, I'm glad you make millions. I'm glad that you're everywhere in the world, but like, I'm not, I just can't handle you also taking over my NBA. Okay. There's got to be some, some boundaries. 
Well, with it's like five friends too, which I didn't really, maybe they're famous too, but I didn't know who those guys were. And I'm like, I don't understand why this is even a thing right now. All right, let's move on because if you don't like basketball, you've already left. Um, let's talk movies, man. I'll, I'll let you kick it off. Like any movies that really stand out this year that you want to talk about? Um, and, then, and then I'll uh, share some. Maybe you have some crossover. I'm sure we do because I know well, I know Oppenheimer is going to come up. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the – I think Oppenheimer is – not. And that's not the only – I saw John Wick 4 in the theaters because uh, I'm that dude. And then I saw Oppenheimer in the theaters too. I'm just a Chris Nolan uh, fan in general. Like I think he makes like some of the best movies. Uh, they're all like all the Dark Knight stuff. I think is legit. Uh, Inception was legit. Uh, Prestige. All of these uh, are great. And I thought Oppenheimer for what it is. Like it's if you don't again. Like I didn't know all the history, and I don't think people like I didn't know he was homies with Einstein, which is fucking wild to think. Um, and the fact that we all haven't killed each other yet too, which is kind of crazy. Um, but no, Oppenheimer, I saw in the theaters and, and John Wick four in the theaters are the, the only two I saw. And they're both, I thought they're both, you know, good for what they were obviously completely different, but Oppenheimer was the shit. I have not seen John Wick four. So I got to see that at some point. Um, the, you know, so what's crazy about Oppenheimer is, you know, I, I know it was a masterpiece. I will say though, like in theaters, like, and I think that was the intention. It was a punishing experience. Every, it, it, you know what I mean? Like I, I was like, I'm there for three hours and you can't move. And I'm like, and just getting punished with the noise and the sounds. And again, I think purposefully, um, but like as good as, as good as it was in terms of what it was, it, it, it doesn't even hit the top five of Nolan's resume. Right. I, I, I put all the dark nights, uh, interstellar, one of my favorites, uh, awesome. I think prestige is awesome too. But then obviously inception, like how good is Christopher Nolan? Like, I think he's, I mean, to me, he's, those are my favorite. Again, I'm a Christian Bale fan too. So he uses Christian Bale in half the movies. Uh, actually uses the same people in, in damn near all the movies. I mean, Cillian is in a lot of the movies too. So uh, yeah, he's my, I just watched Interstellar actually. The other day it was on here while I was doing mobility. Oh. And I find myself just like, oh yeah, this is just badass. Like he's the man. Oh no, that, that, that movie, I, I think I've seen that uh, at least five times now. And every time I see it, I, I just have a bigger appreciation for it. I mean, he really like uh, great movies. And again, I think I have to, I got to see Oppenheimer again when it comes out, like at home. Cause I'm at the point now, man, it's like, I don't mind a three hour movie, but again, like I want to be in my Norma tax with my legs elevated. I want to be able to take a bathroom break. You know, I want to be able to have my own food. I do. I do believe that we are, we are in a post movie theater era officially because again like for guys like you and i like if, if you have these types of amenities at home like you got to really in incentivize me to come to the theater you know and again like i i went out and supported the whole barbenheimer right so i went to see barbie with my wife and then we also saw oppenheimer on the same weekend uh barbie was huge too by the way and again shout out to um ryan gosling you got to give that guy credit man Takes his fitness seriously. Funny guy. He's he's been pretty prolific. Um, and I, I thought I thought Barbie was pretty entertaining. Again, like it's obviously not a bro film, okay? But um, you know, you got you gotta you gotta you know you gotta support what the ladies like to watch too. So um, it uh, it was entertaining for sure. Yeah, I didn't uh, I didn't see Barbie. Of course you didn't obviously. see. It. Uh, I almost we almost rented it one night, but I'm like. Uh, let's watch something else instead. Like, and we try to do stuff together when we can, but that's more of a, like the other day I watched, um, I had a lady here. She kept telling me to watch like violent Christmas, uh, which is, it's terrible um, for one, but she's like, you know, I think you'll, I think you'll like it. It's the dude from stranger things. He's the main character. Like John Leguizamo is in it. Um, it's just really bad. Uh, and he just Santa Claus like kills a bunch of people and shit. And they do some parts from like home alone. Uh, but I know like if there's a chance for me to like watch this awful thing or at least try to, like it has to be so low because it's like Heather's not going to sit through that for more than five minutes, nor, not, nor would I for like a Hallmark movie. Um, I'm sure Barbie's decent and maybe one time we'll watch it, but she hasn't uh, forced me into it yet. Well, there's actually a good amount of bro humor in it. Like uh, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but I, there, there's there's a good amount of stuff I think you'll you'll laugh at just in terms of just uh, 
just a critique on men in general uh, that I think you can appreciate. Again, like I think a lot of the reaction was, you know, oh, this is hypercritical of men and the patriarchy. Again, it's like it's a fucking movie. Calm down. It's a movie, and actually, it's it's really a comedy. So, um, you know, there's a couple other movies that really stood out to me. Um, so, I'm mean, gonna this is this is an interesting one, and I discounted it at first because it, it just can't kind of seem like a teen movie, which it is. But um, it's called Freaky with Vince Vaughn. It's on freebie right now, another one of these apps. But basically, uh, Vince Vaughn is like this psycho serial killer. And I'm not, there's no spoiler alert here. You see this in the preview. And uh, when he's trying to kill this girl, they switch bodies. And then the serial killer is now in a teenage body. And then the, the, the teenage girl is in Vince Vaughn's body. And Vince Vaughn, man, like, like th that's what I'm saying. Like, too, if, if you're weary of trying the movie, let's give Vince Vaughn a little bit of credit. I mean, who, who's who's been funnier the last 20 years than Vince Vaughn? Can you name someone? I mean, he's been in some just, I mean, Will Ferrell and him, but they're in a lot of the same, like they're in some bangers, dude. Like Will, because like, again, we're going through, like obviously Elf was on the other day. And then we had shit playing in here, like old schools playing in here. Step Brothers is playing in here. And I'm like, okay. But then you go like the Vince Vaughn is in like a handful of those and like wedding crashers and couples retreat like you go down the list like the dude has made some bangers dude four christmases that's a good one. Oh, it's a great movie yeah great. I mean, so if anything like we i think we do this too often now like show some respect show up for, show up for vince vaughn watch this movie because the, the ratings are off the charts people that watch it but it, it was one of those movies that um you know people I, I think people slept on we just saw it like this week and uh vince vaughn is is, is so funny like the mannerisms he takes on to be like a teenage girl. And uh, it, it's not, and it is like over the top gruesome at moments. So I guess it's not a family movie, but like, I guess it depends on the family. Like my family would have really enjoyed watching this growing up. Uh, but I, I had a strange family, a little bit dysfunctional. So maybe that speaks to uh, the problem. Did you see uh, Super Mario Brothers? That I didn't see. Did you? Yeah. It's like if you're, kid like if you grew up on nintendo all the all the stuff matches like everything from the games they did a good job matching it to the movies like all the audio stuff is all the same stuff like from the game and it's a i mean for what it is like it's a pretty good story or however you would do mario brothers obviously better than the i think it was john leguizamo that did like the like when they were like real people they did like mario brothers like back in the day where they dressed up in fucking costumes yeah. like this is this is a much better version of that. Okay, so I, I'm going to check out John Wick 4. I'm also going to check out the Mario Brothers. There, there's two movies that um, you guys have to check out if you haven't seen. So one uh, is Speak No Evil. And, um, like, th this was one of the, like, I'll kind of set, again, without any spoilers. Um, and I will say, too, like, if I guess if you have kids or you're really triggered. This is probably not the movie for you. But again, you know, my wife is heavy into like psychological and horror with her podcast, Twisted Mirror. So we're always watching these types of things, you know, just to kind of see what's out there and, you know, getting ideas and inspiration. But um, essentially, uh, a couple with kids is targeted by another couple. And what, what kind of happens is, is the most intense like psychological warfare I've ever seen implemented on on another like uh, from one couple to another um it, dude it was mind blowing like this 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 movie shook me up like this this is a uh, this is not for everyone but i think if you if you like to be like put in that type of situation where like you're seeing the true evil nature that hum humanity is is capable of this movie is that um it does have uh subtitles which i know is a real turn off to a lot of people but um, I think a lot of people also discount some of these international films because of that. Like we, you know, we don't want to just be the ugly American that's unwilling to watch, you know, content only in our, our native tongue. I've been there like, but I, I, I've been opened up to some awesome movies, uh, last couple of years by just getting over that. And by the way, you, you do get over it quick after like the first five or 10 minutes anyway, but speak no evil, like got to check that one out. And the last one I'll say it just came on Netflix this week. Uh, leave the world behind. I watched it. You saw it too? 
Yeah, on uh, Saturday maybe. I had put it on. I'm like, Heather, Heather's sister's in town, so I'm like, I have a little more free time than normal. Uh, and I'm like, I don't think she's going to watch this. It was long, though. Like, a way bigger investment than I thought. It was long, but what, what were your thoughts? I mean, the end, I don't want to spoil anything. Like, the ending wasn't my favorite uh for sure I, I like movies like that um like i i don't want to talk tv shows too i have not finished the last of us like i've seen some of the episodes of that series like i like that type of shit um it was cool it was all right uh it was just there's other there's shit i thought could have been better but like i watched it like obviously and i didn't think it was terrible like parts of it were really good uh you probably could have done some stuff different i don't know how you again with a movie that's not like a, a, it's like a series. Like to me, that movie could have been an entire series of how things would have played out. Is what I would have liked to seen. I guess. I mean, that's a fair assessment. Again, for me, because you know, I, I wasn't expecting much because it was a Netflix movie. Because again, the trend has been like like really lazy production lately for especially the, like the movies that are made like as originals through these streaming platforms, but. Uh, what I loved about it was just the, like some classic cinematography, like some of the shots, man, some of those sweeping shots that are like one shot going from like, like towards the end when they flash towards the city and come back to the house. Uh, I pay attention to that stuff because again, I've, I've been both behind uh, and in front of the camera. And I know when I'm on a shoot where like, I'm not really dealing with professionals here. This, this is just like a paycheck type of deal, which a lot of these like, originals on the streaming platforms is but i thought the soundtrack and the music was incredible great cast oh great dude cast characters um and the tension there was just a lot of tension like you said it was long but i think they, they did a really good job of building the tension and um i'm also fascinated by these like apocalyptic type things and uh, again without spoiling anything um one thing i really took from it is like God, if the internet like went out, like we'd be so fucked. Like, what, what, how, how do you and I make money without the internet? I know you have a gym, what? but like, <laughs> me in particular, bro, like within, within a couple days, like I'm going to be selling copies of my book on the streets. Yeah. I mean, if that, I mean, if that, like a solar flare or if it was like a power grid thing or whatever, cyber attacks, whatever you want to call it, none of us make it very long, dude. Like, I just, again, I'm not trying to be, like, super depressing on here. Um, it's like, you, you theorize, like, oh, I would, you know, do this and this. I go, it would be complete fucking anarchy and complete chaos with everybody. And you you watch during the pandemic, dude, people like, again, the psychological of, like, we're going to just grab the toilet paper because we see the shelf getting empty. It's not there. We need to hoard it. Now, if it was, like, the old taco seasoning packets, you're not going to do that because you won't notice it. But just the the visually seeing things happen around you. So yeah, if you didn't have the internet, I mean, most people can't do anything. Like, especially if you're like, again, not to go crazy, but like your cars, some of these vehicles are controlled. Like where we live, they have these, it's called Waymo. I don't know if you guys have them there. They're the cars they drive themselves. Nobody drives these cars around here. They're picking people up and taking them places and there's no fucking drivers. There's none. And sometimes they fuck up and, and like, turn into oncoming traffic and do weird shit like that's a real thing but those are controlled by a computer somewhere and somebody and now if your signal goes down or whatever I'm like what happens to those people in those cars and where do those cars go like it would go sideways real fast if we don't have our infrastructure set up dude like this is why you know again i think you have to have i joke about us being um i shared something recently about just my experiences with like ai I, I just I find AI to be just so hilarious at this stage um, in terms of like, you know, it's attempts to design um, some of the stuff that it creates. Uh, but we are literally living in the times that as growing up in like the 80s and 90s, like movies were trying to predict like what the, what would happen with AI and tech and in the future. And like we're literally living in the times that movies like The Terminator and you know that we're like trying to predict so it, it's do we are it's a special time to be alive good bad and ugly um we're, we're living in it like this is the beginning of whatever it's going to be and, and all like all i know is it's going to happen really fast the next three to five years are going to determine i think the future 
of mankind in a lot of ways. Yeah, so if you like that type of stuff, like Leave the World Behind is probably a good movie. Well, it's it's good for you to see and watch and just not to be like fatalistic, but just how thin the layer is that we live behind uh, in the world and, and everything that goes on. And yeah, to your point, the AI shit, I don't know. That's what people ask me, like, what, what are you going to do in next year or three years or five years? I'm like, I don't know, dude. I don't know what to tell you because I've never seen anything move this fast at this pace. Uh, like when I'm in college, you have a like a Nokia phone with T9 Word and Snake on it. And you don't really call anybody because it costs money. And you sure as fuck don't text anyone. Now you have these phones that are like super computers, essentially. And everybody and their brother has one. And now you're going to have, again, I, I say there are cars here that drive around and nobody's in them and they pick you up like an Uber that has been happening here for a long time. And there's no one in them. Like how long until that's all that there is. Is it a year? Is it two years? And then people don't drive Uber anymore. I mean, some people do, I don't know. They'll figure out how to do Uber eats or all the other things, but it's definitely like a disruptor for sure. And I think obviously there's some good things from it that will happen, but uh, we are not like, mentally prepared or like equipped for the disruption that is going to take place. And I, I hope a lot of it's good, but the person in me feels like a lot of it's going to be not so great either. Hold on to your titties. That's what, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Uncle baby. Like again, after watching that movie too, Uncle baby biscuits is like, you know what? I gotta, I gotta like, I gotta learn some more man shit, like how to make a fire. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into my survivalist mode. Um, and again, like, I, I'm not trying to, I'm joking a little bit at the same time too. Like, you got to also respect the awesome power of technology. And again, like, one of the things that freaked me out is, you know, I read an article, uh, I don't know if you're, you're seeing on top of the whole open AI thing with the CEO and stuff like that. But essentially, uh, what, I, what I took from this article is, um, up until this point, everything with AI has been binary, like zero one, like, you know, Yes or no, uh, but part of the big concern that happened in this recent controversy they had was they the AI like demonstrated a level of thinking and improvisation and autonomy that they didn't know was nearly possible at this point at this stage. So um, you know, regarding like solving a specific math problem, that you know, I don't want to get into the specifics of it. You can you can Google it, but like. You know, it's because I've got I've been using uh, a part of the stuff I do on, on YouTube. Like I use something called um, what's it called? But anyway, like AI is baked into it where like they suggest headlines, even like can generate thumbnails for you or descriptions for your video. And, uh, you know, it's it's obvious to me when it is AI still at this moment, much like stuff through chat, chat GPT is. But again, it's just the speed with which it can be accomplished. Like uh, uh, something to, to post on YouTube that might take 30 to 60 minutes, you can get done in a couple minutes. For a creator, I mean, that means I can get out probably three videos in a day where it might have only gotten one in the past, you know? Um, and obviously some people are using it to write their newsletters. There are trainers out there right now using it to send out the workouts that people are paying for. Because most people don't even know the difference. They could not even tell the difference. Now, people that follow you and I, they're, they're not the average fitness consumer. They're high level people that can just truly tell the difference between, you know, fakes and real ones, you know, um, which is why you and I will always have a smaller audience than a mainstream household name, because we're not, we're just not about that life of the bullshit and all this other stuff too. And again, I think you and I also, we don't enjoy making content for like the eternal beginner that like, frankly, they're going to be better off just taking Ozempic. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can talk about that too. I will say like with the chat GPT shit, like you can use, again, there's a lot of good tools out there. Um, but even if it's like, Hey, write me a sales copy for X, Y, Z, you still have to change a lot of it. I mean, to me anyway, I could see, but I, a normal person who really doesn't give a shit, like it's an easy way to get stuff out there, even though it's not your stuff. And again, normal people really don't give a shit and it's probably going to be fine. Uh, but yeah. Uh, for us, it's probably a little bit different. We give a shit, uh, too much for sure, which I hate to say that and, and sound like this old person who's just finished. Uh, but like you care, uh, way more than 
a normal person does in fitness or most professions. I think there's a, a segment of people who give a shit and then people who just kind of punch a clock. Um, and again, if you're, if you just want to jump into Ozempic, fuck it, we'll just go the Ozempic route too. Well, you know what, let's, let's say, you know, we're going to, you know, this, this is good. Uh, best practice, social media, save the, the hottest topic towards the end of the episode yeah. to increase the watch time. And we were joking by the way, too. Like, if you can get someone to watch a long form video on YouTube right now for more than two minutes, you are an elite content creator. Two minutes, Jeremy. And I'm getting people to watch at least five to six minutes total. So we're going to put the Ozempic topic towards the end of the episode. Okay. It's depressing, man, to this. Again, there are a lot of technologies. Great. Love it. But the fact that the attention span is that that short for so many mediums like if you can get somebody to watch something for three minutes or four minutes that's what i mean like is there another iteration of social media before ai just takes it over like is there a a tick tock you know two that's even more addicting um than what we have now and then obviously they'll just be like this ai version of whatever the the internet's going to be that's where it kind of bugs you out because you see like how good these things are at just sucking people in. And that, that my fear is it only gets worse where people are, are glued to headsets or whatever all the time, because it's feeding you exactly what you're kind of looking for. Like if, if, if Heather's like, I don't look at Instagram like a normal person. I kind of post, I get off of it. I try not to be on it just it's not good for me uh it's not healthy i don't it doesn't make me feel good i don't like it i mean i'm happy to help people and do the things and that's fine but if her feed looked like mine or her like suggested was on my phone i'd never want to look at it because i don't give a shit about the same things and vice versa like i'll find her scrolling on it like crazy if hers was uh ufc commentary and 90s basketball highlights she'd be like this is stupid i don't want to be on it but the the platforms the algorithms they know what you want to do and they know how to suck you in they're better at it than you are and i know you think like you can escape it but unless you have these guardrails in place you can't because it will suck you in and i do think the next version of it will be even gnarlier than this man oh man i mean again what's interesting too is like you and i like people are always shocked by this. Like they think like we're listening to a bunch of these different fitness podcasts. So like you and I don't really consume fitness content because we're not interested in fitness. We do, we are fit. We just do fit shit. You know what I mean? Like you people, a lot of people like to listen to fitness and hear people talk about it, but like we actually do fit shit. Um, we like to listen to things about sports and, you know, pop culture, various different things. Obviously you're, you're into a lot of the financial strategy stuff. Um, but people are always shocked by that. Like, I'll listen to your podcast, but like part of the thing too is for me, I don't like, like I like my own takes and my own approaches to kind of be my own. And I also know that if you're, you know, this is just inherent to, to human nature, like subconsciously you take in other people's ideas and approaches just by consuming it. And then some would say, well, then you're, you're only, you're being closed-minded or you're not opening up to the vast uh, knowledge and wisdom of other people out there. But again, like, we all have our own approaches and personally, like I, I like to just have a very organic approach. And, and part of that is like not consuming a lot of fitness content, you know? Um, Cause then it's like, I, literally I just, I'm making things up based on my own experience and what I want to do. Um, and, and we're both also not like, like, again, you and I both, it, we, we got into this for lifestyle. We, we didn't really, like we don't need to have people know our names or our faces. Uh, in fact, the, if we can achieve the lifestyle without any of that, like that's that really is like correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that is like your long term goal to not be recognized necessarily. Um, and I bring this up because like we both saw this Barry Sanders documentary, and what was so crazy about Barry Sanders is like simultaneously you have Dion Sanders, and by the way, I love. The showmanship and the showboating and, and 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 the swag and all that came with Dion, the high stepping. But I much more relate to the like day to day workmanship of a Barry Sanders. Like he 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 scores an basically 
he's already ran 50 yards before he even crosses the line of scrimmage, juking and, and, and bouncing and spinning. And then he runs and hits an 80-yard touchdown, and he just hands the ball to the referee. You know what I mean? Like, that's just that simple act, that humility he had. And uh, also, like, one of the first guys that had ever walked away, like, not, like, towards the end of his prime, but, like, he was, like, thick in the middle of it. This He would have, without a doubt, broken the rushing record um, that Emmett Smith ended up overtaking. Um, talk to me about, like, because you said, like, this guy's my spirit animal. Oh, dude, first of all, that's a great doc. If you guys can watch it, it's on Amazon Prime. It's called Bye Bye Barry. It's maybe 90 minutes total. And it's cool because, like, all the Detroit dudes are in there. Tim Allen, Jalen Rose, Eminem. Like, they got all oh, Jeff Daniels. All those dudes are in there. And, again, I love Dion too. Like, if we're playing street football, I get a pick, bro. And if I go down the sidelines, like, yeah, dude, I'm, like, pretending I'm Dion, you know, as you go in the end zone. Because Dion was the shit, dude. Like, he was just, again, one of the greatest athletes to ever live. And I loved him for what he did. Uh, is that my personality type? Uh, no. I always would joke, like, in my greatest sports moment, I never, you know, jumped up and cheered. It's not – I go to a basketball game. I don't say a fucking word. I don't really clap. I just sit there and watch. I'm a terrible fan in that regard. If you wanted me to be super loud, but I'm actually like watching, you know, the game. So to see Barry, yeah, it's, it's like, he didn't even give a shit about any of the stuff. Like they schedule his game in Japan because they didn't even think he'd be up for the Heisman. He's not even there to win it. They announce he wins and basically no expression changes on his face. It's like, it didn't matter he'd leave these trophies that he wins like around people's houses. He'd do the most wild shit again, easily would have became the rushing champion. Like he's prime prime him, but just, it wasn't about, he cared like whistle to whistle and, and nothing else. And, you know, I know a lot of people, you know, I don't, how do I say this? Like in a nice way, like it's kind of what I want to be able to do. Like, I like all the stuff, like the attention we get and all the things it's great. Um, especially for us, like we run a business physical and there's like, Hey, are you going to have a, a Christmas party and do this and this and this? It's like, dude, we give so much already, um, to everybody all the time, digitally and in person. It's like, it's a lot to do more than once the whistle's gone. Like I wouldn't, if I was an athlete, like I wouldn't want to do all the, the media promotional tours and stuff. I'm like, I understand it's like the guys who do for fights, right? Like UFC or boxing. They go on these huge promo tours. They got to do all this media. Same thing for movies. Like that part sucks. Like I just want to do the thing. And then when I'm done, just kind of leave me alone. And like Barry Sanders is that like times a million. And it's super cool to see because I don't think you'll ever, first of all, you'll never see a dude move like him. Like just start, stop, like insanity. The shit he's doing like to the best dudes in the world and to never celebrate like nothing. It's, unbelievable and those listening on youtube by the way i'm going to throw in one of these clips for like there, there's a three minute burst and i recorded on my phone i recorded the tv with my phone so we can bypass some copyright issues um but where you just see like uh, he he in my opinion is the greatest running back of all time and that's that's tough to say especially when you have a guy like jim brown um sweetness but the agility that barry sanders demonstrated the thickness of his legs, his, his his overall balance and center of gravity. And again, a lot of people would say that he doesn't have the uh, the top end speed that some of these taller, longer cornerback like he sometimes get caught. But again, I think people also for, forgot like the times he got caught, often he had already ran 50 yards just to break the line of scrimmage, going from sideline to sideline, spinning, bouncing. But like the clip where he and again, like I grew up, I'm not a big fan. I don't really, honestly, I'm not an NFL fan anymore. I don't watch football anymore. I'm 41 and I had to make a choice and it's the NBA because I can't do multiple leagues at this age. I got too much shit going on. Um, but I grew up a diehard Green Bay Packers fan and there was no team that gave me more anxiety than playing the Lions. And we often would play them on like Thanksgiving and uh, like Barry said, we'd have these games where like we'd hold them to like negative two, negative three, negative four. 10 yard loss. And all of a sudden he would burst a 60, 80 yard run. Uh, but the movie put on Reggie white, where he basically like the minister of defense, like the, the, the one of the all time defensive players, like you put Reggie white, Lawrence Taylor. Um, like 
I can't, I, I really can't even think of a third off the top of my head right now in terms of like all time D lineman. Some people might throw in a guy like Warren Sapp at nose. Um, but like Reggie White and Lawrence Taylor, uh, like the move he put on Reggie White and the way Reggie White just basically like he broke Reggie White's ankles and, and he moved like the way the screen caught it. So he was on one side of the screen and then with he was on the other side of the screen and Reggie White is just falling to the ground. Um, I don't think we'll ever see a physical talent like that again. Like he was literally the great one above, like built the ultimate running back. And again, a stature that uh, made him kind of like a bowling ball. Like, you know what I mean? Like he, he was tough to see sometimes. Like, he, like he'd be here all of a sudden, like he just, the linebackers couldn't even see him over the linemen. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts? I, again, it's always tough to say goat, but like, um, and he would he would take himself out of games because he didn't want to break a record because he didn't want to take away from the team. Like th these are things that are just not like they don't exist in today's clout chasing, fame seeking world. Like the goal a lot of kids have today is just become famous on social media. Well, yeah, he would do it like in high school. Like he could be the the high school city rushing champion, and he's super close, and he's just like, no, nah, I don't need to go back in the game. Like as a high school kid. That's crazy. Like, I get it. Like, as you get older, maybe you're a pro. Most people don't mature. Because, again, most pros are young, young dudes in their 20s. He's doing that in high school, which is that's like in his DNA or whatever, whether it's nature or nurture, like you name it. But he would do it. And I would say, like, styles make fights, right? Like, when you watch him, like, he's the greatest of all time to me. Like, if you – I always go by if you had a pick. Like, if you had a – one draft pick for running back who would be your first dude i'm like would be barry sanders and not just because the style of it like he's like a tyson like is tyson the greatest boxer ever no but his style though is something that you would never see like it was just this completely different and when you watch barry sanders run like again I, there's a lot of dudes who've been great like obviously i'm a vikings fan when adrian peterson's in his wow. prime it's amazing to watch it's a different style but Barry Sanders is a different thing completely. Like I've never seen anybody do the shit. He's doing shit in the NFL that is what like high school kids do. Like if you're the best high school dude, you can run around in the backfield and make dudes miss and stuff and turn nothing into something and score just because you're more athletic or quicker and, and shiftier than everybody else. He's doing that in the league. Like that is – I've never seen that before, and I don't think anybody will ever see it again. So if you never didn't watch him as a kid or you're younger, um, it's just a great documentary in general. But just to see some of those highlights, you you forget like, oh, yeah, he was he was built different. And, and by the way, like obviously as, uh, you know, meatheads, fitness pros, like the lower body development, like he, he may have had the best legs of all time. I mean, like this, this dude would rep out 600-pound back squats. I mean, like, if you look at his legs, and again, he was rarely injured. Um, that, that, that's, I mean, uh, running back in the NFL is like the worst thing you can ever do for your body. You're getting 20 hard like collisions a game, and guys are going at your knees, your ankles. Um, you're getting hit by guys that are 250 to 300 pounds that can run a 4-5-40. Um, so, I mean, he really just had, like, a resilience to his body and, uh, again, like, some all-time legs some all-time legs. Like Barry Sanders could have been whatever he wanted to be athletically, just like a LeBron James, a Michael Jordan, um, a, a, honestly, a Mike Tyson. I mean, they just – they could have been whatever they wanted to be. Obviously, there was something that was they were best suited for, like all these guys. But, uh, I mean, <laughs> can you imagine LeBron James at tight end? Well, it's a, they're, they're, the, they're the freak of freaks, right? I always say they're, they were never going to work at Wells Fargo. 100%. Like, they, they had a path that was going to happen for them no matter what. I mean, I'm not saying they didn't work super hard because they all do, but it's like when that mix of, like, freak show meets work ethic and then you find the shit that you like, like, that's who those dudes become. And, yeah, for Barry, too, even some of the clips they'll show in the movie, like, he's shredded. Like, he'll be in the locker room. And he's just there. Like, he's he's dense. He's thick. He's shredded. Super athletic and durable as hell, man. Just uh, it's a good watch for sure. Oh, absolutely. And uh, to that next point too, on, on the documentary tip, did you see Arnold on Netflix? Yeah, it's good. 
I thought it was pretty good too. Like, what were your biggest takeaways? Like, obviously, there, there's this scene where he's like training in his his gym with no sound, no music, and he's just on the chalkboard, just like knocking off sets. Um, and and which obviously goes through him as an athlete. Uh, I think it was athlete, actor, activist. Like this guy's had three uh, three lives in one. Um, what were some of your biggest takeaways? And by the way, it's on Netflix. I highly recommend it. If you grew up uh, during the eighties, nineties, uh, I just, th there are a lot of good insights and, you know, also you get a lot of wisdom from this guy, you know, some of the mistakes he's made, but um, I, I got to get your reaction, especially like his, some of that training footage where they're just like talking about what he was doing, the, like the volume, like a so hundred sets of <laughs> workouts. Yeah. I always wonder like, you know, is it, is it real? Like how much do they exaggerate it all? Like, is it completely legit? I mean, and for him, it, it, it probably was. I always say this about him in general, like his life, like regardless of, you know, obviously he's made mistakes. Like we all have and he's done, we all do stupid shit, but this dude comes to America becomes, what is he? Seven time Mr. Olympia. And which you're, if you win Mr. Olympia and get it, what it is now versus what it was, I think is a different thing, but it still is the most prestigious title in all of bodybuilding. And he not only won that multiple times becomes the most famous bodybuilder of all time. I don't think that's even arguable. He's the most recognized one of it. He's essentially the guy who, you know, he's not the first, but he is the godfather of it. In my opinion, if you think of that, like he's who you think of, then he becomes the most famous action movie star probably of all time. Uh, you can go down the list, uh, especially, but he made it like, oh, you're an action movie star. Like he is at the top, like just making bangers on top of bangers. And then, oh, you just become the governor of California. Now, if you do one of those things in your life, like you've lived a, a successful life in terms of career, this fucking guy did all three of those things. That is something I don't think can ever be replicated ever. Like it's just, it's, it's a literally, it's, he's one of one for sure. Oh yeah. No, again, like w w one of the biggest things I took from it too, um, is again, you just see it in the people that are able to achieve like a level of hyper-focus, you know what I mean? Like he just, when that man set his mind on something, he, he was the Terminator. Like he was the Terminator. Like, but again, like you don't realize it because of his charm and his humor and uh, one of the things that I took from it as well, again, having a father that came to this country uh, and didn't know English and had to learn on the fly at 30, um, but also the insecurity that came with it. Like you never really feel comfortable around native English speaking people and um, where he kind of like flipped the script and he leaned into his accent, you know, like it was just a refusal to let any of the common shortcomings. Oh, he's an idiot. He's dumb because he's just a meathead. He's just muscle. Um, but the reality is one of the highest forms of intelligence is a sense of humor, wit. Uh, you know, so I, I just, and then obviously the work ethic in the gym, you know, like um, he, he was unique in the sense that, you know, like he loved to train with his competitors. Like that, that doesn't happen anymore. People, uh, they don't, I mean, they, they occasionally like these guys in, in the NBA, for example, they'll do like pickup games in the summer and stuff. But like a lot of it is like, let's hide, not share any of my secrets you know, um, we're like, he, he, if he got beat, he would invite the guy to train with him so he could learn why he got beat and, and steal from them, you know, like, so th there was obviously you can't achieve what he did without ego, but he had enough of a willingness to put his ego to the side, um, to get better and to keep improving. And, um, I don't know, just, I thought that was a, a really, uh, insightful documentary. I did a full podcast on it just because, He's, he's been a big impact. I, I, I've got – my grandma is, is literally from Austria. She came right after World War II to, to America. Um, so, you know, I've, I've got some of that. That's probably where the, the thickness comes from, the Austrian oak. You know, Austrians, like, you know, it's schnitzel, it's uh, stroganoff, like it's thick, creamy foods. Like you just become big and strong as fuck if you eat Austrian cuisine. It's just big stock. Even the women. The women are like 5'10" built like trees. Um, but, uh, I, I just took a lot from it again. Also like 
you know, his big rival was Sly. And did you see the Sly documentary? I haven't seen it yet. Is it good? So it's only one episode, um, or it's not a three-part series like Arnold. And it, it was different than I was expecting. Um, he spends a lot of time talking about his early life and like trying to break into acting and, but a lot of the same things, like they thought he was like, he was only capable of playing like a thug. Um, and he was discounted in terms of his writing ability and, you know, uh, being successful at Rocky and Rambo, like he had a hard time diversifying and doing different things. Um, you know, one, one thing, so there's one thing he said in it, again, you got to watch it just because you and I both grew up on the Rockies. Um, I, one of my favorite lines you ever said was, I know we said this before in a different episode, but it was getting ready for like a men's health thing. I think it was Metastrat Extreme. And you asked me, do I need to be like, uh, you know, Rambo shredded or Rocky Four shredded? And I knew exactly what you meant. I forget the exact quote, but um, I mean, these movies like defined us. Yes. But you got to watch it. And, and one thing that I, I was uh, not disappointed, but like, I, like, I don't know if I agree with that. He said the first 40 years of your life is addition. And then every year after that is subtraction. Um. And I think that's unique to his experience whereby like he had all the su su success, uh, like for, he was living um, under the radar for so long and all of a sudden Rocky hits. And then he's, he is like the, one of the biggest stars in the world, but then was unable to like recapture that moment for the rest of his career, which again happens to almost anyone who just like, he can't make multiple thrillers or multiple bads, you know? Um, you know, it's at some point, you got to leave um, or, or you're just, you're, you're, you're doing the best you can. Maybe it wasn't as good as it was in the past. I don't know. But um, that, that was kind of depressing to hear. Um, and maybe that, again, that was his personal experience. I know. I, I, I hope it's the opposite because I'm actually looking forward to hopefully the next 40 years. I'm blessed to be here. Um, but I, I know what he meant, but you know, again, I think there's been a sadness to the last like 10 to 20 years or so, I think, because he's been chasing the past. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like, if you ever listen to uh, NBA guys talk about like when they're done, like I think it was, I've heard Ben Gordon talk about it. Uh, even like fuck, Nick Young talks about it, uh, Gilbert Arenas. They're like, what does a retired 30 year, two year old dude do who has a hundred million dollars? And he's like, he's depressed he goes he's depressed all day he goes because all we ever did was play basketball like all we did was this thing and now we're not that person anymore now that thing is is gone and again if you again i don't know is acceptance is the right word or whatever it is but sometimes things just aren't going to be like what they were um that's just reality like not that certain things can't get better and you know there's different additions to life but if you're lebron like yeah it's still cool what he does but there's going to come a day sooner than later where it's not that and then it will never be that again like you watch barry sanders now he's not barry sanders of when i was a kid like there's just seasons of life that certain things will happen you can you know try to hold on to them as much as you can and it's tough for everybody obviously because you know even arnold right like he's i think there's a where he's like i don't really like what i look like in the mirror because you're comparing to the, like the greatest of all time and now it's you're, you're not that anymore which is kind of wild it is yeah you know I, I guess on a positive note uh what i took from the slide thing was he really understood how to message to the audience. I mean, he really got it. So, um, you know, that, that, that's, I, th I think, I think you'll, again, it isn't as good as the Arnold documentary for, for lots of reasons, but um, you do get a, a real insight into the mind of this guy who like, you know, most people would be lucky to have a single franchise, but he had two, you know, Rambo and Rocky are like two all time franchises. Um, you know, and, and he really knew, like, the fact that he can make, like, these, he makes these endless sequels and they're still compelling. And even the worst ones, like Rocky Five, I've got no problem watching multiple times, you know, over and over again. Um, so 
I guess finishing on the uh, the TV piece, there were two like kind of classic shows that came to an end this year. Uh, one is Succession, which I know we we we, te- we would text about, and then I don't know if you wa- have Showtime or watch Showtime, but Billions also just ended. Um, and, and Billions, you know, most people say it maybe went a couple seasons too long, and it wasn't what it was at its peak and and, and its ending, but. Um, Two great TV shows that came to an end. Uh, but did you have you seen Billions? Uh, I have not. I haven't finished Billions. Like we, I don't even know what season I'm on right now. Um, it does start off awesome. It does get a little, again, like a lot of shows. It just it it, ha- it evolves how it evolves, and it's not. Uh, it got a little bit weird in some parts, or not. I don't know. It's not. It's good, but the early shit is great. Uh, Succession. All time, dude. It's, oh, four yeah. se- it's four seasons. They're bangers. If you guys have never seen it, you have to see it. And you like want to root for people. Like you want to like people. They're all fucking terrible humans. They're all shit bags. Every single one. No, yeah, exactly. Again, I did. I did a. My wife and I did. I think it was a full podcast on this. Um, I really liked it. I mean, from start to finish. And again, like. We mentioned Barry, like Barry left. I mean, you could say well, he left too soon. Well, it's better leaving too soon than leaving in a body bag, right? Like with, with nothing to give the rest of your life. Like it's such an art form, art form, knowing when to leave and leaving people wanting more. And lately the trend has been like, how, how can we keep like stringing people along enough and keep monetizing and, and, and making things go way longer than they ever should, you know, like through, you know, Three to four seasons is probably all you need in most series, right? And and you and you end up leaving people wanting more. Maybe there's a spinoff that comes out of it, like um, you know, the way Breaking Bad spun off into Better Call Saul. Both, by the way, like um I mean, top I guess top five TV series that come to mind for me. And again, it's my biases. Um, and even though Game of Thrones, I wasn't happy with how it ended. I think they also like again, when you start something without a plan how to end it things often go sideways towards the end, right? Because again, like you have to have, but life is so unpredictable. You never know what, like if a show is going to resonate with the masses, but like Better Call Saul, Breaking Bad, Succession, I would put in there. Uh, Game of Thrones just changed changed TV forever. Like people will always be chasing what Game of, Game of Thrones was putting out a movie weekly. They were doing like weekly movies for a while there. Um where, where where does it rank for you? Uh, I mean, B- billions to me is not going to break into an all time top five, but I think billions was just like I think for again this this might be insulting to some people. I think it was just like it really tapped into like the male persona, you know, of like all the douchebaggery, like metaphors, sports metaphors that would be constantly being used. Um, I d- I do really like Chuck Rhodes. I think. Paul Giamatti is an all timer. And then Bobby Axelrod, man, that dude was in, um, first of all, Homeland. I don't, I, Homeland, incredible, especially like early Homeland. Yep. That series was untouchable. And then he was also in Band of Brothers. Three. So he's been in three now, like the, sh- sh- uh, Billions is an all time series. I mean, number of seasons, uh, at, at one point, one of the more popular shows on premium television. Uh, what are, what are your thoughts? Like, how, how would you rank some of that stuff? Uh, Succession's up there for sure. Uh, Billions is great too. The early stuff is, is amazing. Again, it, it, it changes a little bit for me as it goes. But uh, if you've never seen Succession, like I would watch it for sure. All time stuff, like if I and again, obviously Breaking Bad for me is all time. Uh, I do love like again some of these went like super long, like Sopranos for me. Like if you guys have never seen Sopranos or True Detective, the first season, with McConaughey oh, and Woody, yeah. dude. He, I, I've not watched it back, but we talked about it the other day. I'm like, maybe we should just watch this back. Because I remember I was at, like, a fucking Tony Robbins, like, conference in Chicago. And I never do this. And I just stayed up and watched, like, four of them back to back to back till like, 3 in the morning. Because I just couldn't turn them off. Like, that's what, like, Breaking Bad to me was uh, in the early stages. And the same thing with... Succession, like we didn't start it till this year, and then we got through all four seasons like relatively quick. Just we would just come home and be like, 
boom, 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 boom. Cause it's like, it's, the, it's that type of show. Oh no. I mean like the other piece too, like, you know, Oz, oh. Oz was like my first introduction to like, and we're talking like the, still the early days of HBO. And, and by the way, like what the fuck is happening to HBO max? You're going to take 30 years of brand equity and just piss it away and change your name to Max. I don't get it, man. I'm trying to understand, like, this is where it's like, hey, someone has to step in. Someone's got to step in. Like, I know we're not as successful as HBO, but, like, you and I both know good TV. We've seen its evolution in the last 30 years, and HBO was a leader at every step of the way. Um, Oz, The Wire, Sopranos. Um, Game of Thrones. I mean, like, I mean, Westworld. Westworld. Yeah, like I know a lot of people are into that. I, I, I kind of checked out of Westworld because it got weird. I got lost vibes. Like this is they're basically gonna like they're, they're, they don't know what they're doing, and I just I don't want to be taken for another ride like with Lost. Uh, you know, but but I could be wrong, and maybe I should have kept watching. Maybe I will. Again, it, it it still exists, but to me, it's like what is happening. And they've also like I don't know if you noticed too, like Showtime is like getting rid of their mobile app. Like Showtime is going through a reckoning. These, like these streaming providers, man, are in real trouble. Not just because of the actor strike. Um, you know, it's just people are not supporting. We, we talk about this all the time. Like people are not supporting good content anymore. They're just, um, th there's, there's going to be a, a reckoning for all the freeloading that's been going on, period. Well, it's weird to see like there's so many i think i don't know where it goes but there's so many streaming apps there's so much content there's so many movies there's so much video they can't all make it it's like when you look at you know like even like uh network news now those shows aren't doing the numbers that they used to do they do worse than a lot of podcasts they do worse than a lot of youtube channels like that there's a certain demo that's aging out. And then again, people are just bombarded where it's like, if I go on to Netflix today, dude, what, how the fuck do I even like look at something or pick something? It's almost like, I don't even know where to start. Like I'll try to watch a trailer for a second. I'm like, okay, maybe we'll try this. It, it just, it doesn't seem sustainable for the duration where you can have 87 different apps for all these people and they're always subscribing and, and it, it just can't keep going, I guess the way that I see it. And I, and I think they're starting to feel that cause it's like the ad revenue is starting to just tank for a lot of these people. Well, and then, you know, thank God these actors finally got like some rights for their streaming, but that's also going to, that's going to be affecting now their bottom lines because they, they were pocketing a lot of uh, what will now be royalties towards, um, you know, cause after these negotiations and, um, regarding, you know, streaming rights, AI rights, all this stuff that, by the way, like guys like you and I, like you, you're going to wake up one day, Jeremy, and then all of a sudden you're going to turn something on and you're going to see AI Jeremy Scott saying, uh, like leading a workout. It's going it, to, it's going to happen. And all we can hope is that you're going to get some, some royalties from that, some digital rights. Um, cause you know, fitness is always 10 years behind all these other spaces. Right. Um, so, I mean, that, that's more interesting shit that's coming down the pipe. But uh, you, you, you see, like, when I see a guy like Stephen A. Smith putting so much effort into his, growing his YouTube channel, not even promoting First Take anymore, just, like, exclusively focusing on his YouTube. You know, this is, this is the number one guy in sports broadcasting. Love him, hate him. This is the guy. This guy knows how to put out compelling content. And he is a subject matter expert. He's been doing it a long time. He's provocative. He knows how to pull the strings and push the buttons. And even the sample of the Pat McAfee show, right? Like that was a YouTube show that ESPN is like, we got to get this on ESPN. But I'm I'm certain at one point he's going to be like, you know what? I'm just going to go back to YouTube. Because, you know, why, why would he want to be in a room where people are telling him what to say? You know, like it's a big personality. you like at some point, and I dealt with this at men's health too. It's like, at some point you're like, you know what? I'm just going to go do it myself. Well, you didn't do it myself. Like you're just going to cap me. You're just limiting my creative freedom. And frankly, people are moving over to YouTube. People are just like, people want one place to get all of their stuff. And when you can get these content creators, because people are not willing, ESPN, they're not willing to pay the talent. 
men's health, wasn't willing to pay the talent. They just thought they could bring a trainer off the street and, and things could continue. Well, maybe it could in the short term, but they're going to just find Jeremy Scott. They're going to find me. They're going to find the people that actually know what the fuck they're talking about that can do things to the highest ability in, in their own way. Um, I know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, there's a, I think that's the trend. And I think there's going to be a, a again, continued just disruption across the board because again, I don't watch like live sports. I don't watch TV like ever. Um, we have like, we, we use sling um, for the sports stuff. And then if there's a movie or something, I might click it, but I usually just go to like the on demand and I play them here in the gym for people when we work out just to have background stuff or like when I'm doing a work. A lot of times, like I won't work out to music. I'll just do it to like a movie or something or I'll do us when I'm doing mobility. Um, but it's not like normal TV. I don't turn on like Fox or like TNT to watch TV. I'll do it if there's a sporting game on. And that never was the case before. And a lot of times I won't even turn on sling. I'll go to either typically Netflix or like Amazon Prime, and that's where the stuff comes. And then everything else is on my phone. And it's just weird to see these dudes who historically, but again, it, it used to matter, like if you were on like Johnny Carson, like back in the day, and you got on Johnny Carson, and you were a, an actor or a comedian, a comedian, right? Now fucking 20 million people see you, you're selling out shows. And all of a sudden now, like I couldn't tell you, dude, who's if it's a late show or the late, late show, I don't know who the fuck is on it. Who does it? I don't know who goes on it. I don't even know who watches it or why you would. And that is a, a huge shift. And those shows have to completely just be eating shit. Or I'm using comedy as an example, but like Comedy Central used to be a thing. Maybe it still is. I don't know. But I haven't seen that shit in forever. MTV, like we watched a show. Uh, it's called Bass Reeves. It's a playoff of like this 1883, which is a playoff of Yellowstone. It's kind of this Western story. Of the it's, it's cool to watch. And it's like it's happening right now. But every time it, it's on Paramount Plus, again, another fucking app. But it will show like this MTV logo because apparently MTV is like part of Paramount Plus. I don't even know. But who even watches? What is MTV anymore? Like these things are all, it's dead basically. Like if I told a 10-year-old kid, hey, do you know what MTV is? No clue whatsoever. These A lot of these things are just hanging on. And I think that's where with the, I don't know if it's with AI or with social or the internet or how it's all come together. Like a lot of the things that you know now, I don't think are around in two years. Yeah, man. You know, again, like it's all built in a house of cards. We know this, you know, like it's, and, and people also are just not, um, I mean, we just, we just passed black Friday, cyber Monday. Like most people in this country are now broke. And, and, and if they participated in black Friday, cyber Monday, they participated on credit. Oh, dude, there was like, they showed a video, or maybe it was a couple of them, like the Targets or the Walmarts, and nobody was there. Nobody. A year ago, wild shit. This year, there's nobody there at all. Yeah, I mean, so and it's interesting because, again, like, we're here now in this, like, fractured existence where not everyone has a platform. And, again, like, there's 50 apps that you got to bounce between to, get to find your favorite show. Um and it almost makes you like harken back to the good old times of the power brokers and gatekeepers. But then again, it's like, well, let's not get get too nostalgic about that because that also sucked. Because again, like to, to break in, you know, you just had to sleep with people. So it's like you just had to like, you know, kiss enough ass. And uh, it's great to be past that in some places, but you know, now now it's just we we have no idea who to trust and. People are also not willing to support good content anymore, which means some people are just going to say, fuck it. Like there's going to come a point where you're going to say, fuck it. Cause you're going to just be like, I have all the money I need. I'm not here for the fame. I'm not here for the recognition or the praise. Um, and frankly, uh, people are not supporting the content as much as they should. So I'm going to go do something else. So that's also the danger of this too. Yeah. I think that you'll see that with the, the major streaming stuff for sure. Cause they're just, they're not, the revenue is not adding up to what they need to be. And the same thing with a lot of people in this, like these spaces, what they're not just fitness, but in general, like you got to support the people who are putting this stuff out like consistently. Cause it's their, it's their oxygen. It's their lifeline to continue to do it. And it takes a ton of effort and a ton of time. And if you're not seeing the return 
in your time, like, why would we continue to do this over and over and over? Because it is like, hey, and it's part of your job, but it is an exhausting journey for sure. And look, I get it. People got to make choices right now. Every right now is looking at making choices to figure out how they're going to get through another year of life in a really disruptive, crazy time to be alive, right? We've got an election season coming up next year. Um, <laughs> things are just looking, people don't have a lot of confidence. All right. And by the way, like we're still overcoming a lot of the trauma of the COVID era. Like, so, uh, you know, it's to be expected in a lot of ways, but like, because you have to make choices and we say this as biased individuals, because we are independent operators outside of traditional power brokers again, like, you know, but if you're going to make a choice, you got to support the independent operators because again, like, you want to support the monoliths like ESPN and these other organizations? No, because they don't give a fuck about you. They don't give a fuck about, you know, what's good content and bad content. They care about ratings. They care about ad revenue. Look, we run a business too, but I mean, think of how many things you and I have passed up. Over. Like I had an opportunity to do a, a promotion with Muscle Tech on, on this pre-workout. And again, it would have been, it, it's in the thousands of dollars and I could have used the money at the time. But I'm like, I can't go out here and promote a pre-workout that has almost 400 milligrams of caffeine in a serving. Like, I just can't, like, this is terror. This is not, this is actually not good for you to get this amount of caffeine in your body. This is going to alter your heart rate, your breathing. Like, this is actually not good for your performance uh, long-term. Now, it might get you up to do a workout, but it also might get you up to run through a fucking wall. This is like cocaine level of caffeine. Um, now, a tr the monoliths, they don't give a shit. They're just trying to get their ad revenue. They, again, they don't they don't care about you. Now, you and I are potentially just as selfish in the sense of like, you know, this is our business. We want to do things this way. But like we have just a baseline level of integrity, I guess, unfortunately, that is going to make us have to pass up on easy money because we frankly just can't put bullshit out there. No, too much. And you're connected because it's a, the scale aren't as big. I don't know what you know, ES has to be, but it's like you're millions and millions of people. And we know the people who are in all of our stuff. Like, you know, kind of, if you will, or your top, you know, clients and customer people. And you just shit and you're putting out stuff and you know it's not by, you know, pharmaceutical company or a company or you name it. Like, slave to these things where a lot of these other people, they are, and they have to do and say certain things to, to meet quarterly goals and, and stock numbers and budgets and shit. And like the, the mom and pops don't. And I say this a lot, like you have to support those places, especially like where you, where you live, like the people who cut your hair and where you guys get coffee, where you get your car repaired. Like if you can do it like small business style local, I think you're better off. Cause if you don't, a lot of these places won't exist. Um, they just keep getting swallowed up over and over and over. It's like, I joke here, like I could never do this again. Like, like where I'm sitting right now in this this building that we bought, I couldn't buy this again today. Like the the game, the numbers have changed so much. Like it's it just wouldn't make financial sense to do to have to die to like create a community and environment here for people to be in and to like to go back and like redo all the content and film all the things. Like I, I don't. It's it just without full support and people like just pouring into it over and over and over again. It's just like. It, it, you have to support the people who really give a shit and, and really try. And they are out there. Um, but a lot of times we just, we ask for, for discounts and like, you know, we want to cut corners with those guys. I'm like, if you're going to do it, you do it with Verizon, you do it with Nike, you do it with Apple. You don't do it with like the mom and pop places. And a lot of times we get confused and we just pour into these giant companies. And then eventually all the stuff that you used to love, like just doesn't exist anymore. So one of the worst things that happened in 2023, in my opinion, was when my favorite marinara tomato sauce brand, Rayos. By the way, this is this is the best. It's the best marinara sauce in the game. Period. Like now, it's eight to twelve bucks, depending on what type of flavor you get or where you get it from. But like, it has olive oil. It's extra virgin olive oil in it. Like, you, it's not tomato. It's not marinara sauce. Like it's like hummus. You see hummus. I go, you know, where I'm, where my father's from. Like this is. 
Like it's not hummus unless it has olive oil. It can't have canola oil in it. That's not hummus. It yeah. might have chickpeas in it, but it's not hummus. But anyway, they got acquired by Kraft, and now they're big fucking marinara. They're big marinara now. And I try. I went to Costco and I saw like Rayos has like had a new eggplant parmigiana thing, and I'm like, I got to try this because I love I love Rayos. I've been to Rayos in Hollywood. Amazing. Some of the best meatballs and mozzarella marinara I've ever had. Again, they've got the sauce. They've got the gravy that puts everything together. But, bro, like, this was I, – I didn't even know what I was looking at when, when we, we made it in the oven. It was absolute trash. And I'm like, this is what happens when they become big marinara. Now, again, like, at least the tomato sauce and the, and the jars is still the same. But, like, you got to stop supporting big fitness. You got to stop supporting, um, like – it's like, do I stop buying rails now? It's like, it's going to be tough. But now they're big marinara, and that's a problem. Yeah, it's like most things when they get too big, you get so disconnected from, like, what the mission is or what it's supposed to be, and you just – you are you don't have control anymore. And, then again, it's not a knock. Like, these big companies for certain things need to exist, and they provide a service, and I'm, I'm all for that. But if you think the CEO of, like, whatever giant – fitness company or whatever company for that matter like knows the people that work for them you know like 27 people down the chain or 180 people down the chain like they don't like it, the machine is just meant to run and make money and that's really all that they at the end of the day like whatever the mission is for most that are big enough like they just don't give a shit and you're just like another number and i, I think most people are hopefully waking up to that and hopefully continue to you know support the the stuff out there that really helps them it's like when you ask for uh podcast reviews or all these different things like they're really simple things you guys can do um to support the shit that you love all you gotta say all you gotta do is click the like button okay click a five star give a review that's simple as you know jeremy podcast good bj podcast good it doesn't take a whole lot um but also yeah again like you know it's this stuff takes time, money, and resources to put together. Um, and again, you guys all listening have a choice of what you want to see. And you're not supporting someone, okay? Like, yeah, views can help if there's ads on stuff. But, like, I think people think, like, the I know people have shown up to your studio and they're like, I'm one of your biggest fans. I've listened to every episode. And it's like, well, have you bought Athletic Greens? Are you part of the Jeremy Scott Fitness app? Have you attended my gym? Oh, so you're not, you're actually not a fan at all. Or maybe you're just a fan, but you're, you've never supported the business. And again, it's not to guilt people. It's just like, but you're out there supporting, I mean, each, well, I, what is it called now? Max? They, they, they like legitimately haven't put anything good on that app in six months. I, I, I haven't seen anything good or new on there. Um, but people will be more likely to cancel your subscription or my subscription to keep HBO because people in this country, and this is, I think the next here's now where we talk about Ozempic, right? Because honestly, man, the, the, the fact that we have to actually have a fat loss conversation in this country is the whole problem. It should not be even an issue because if we were a, a society that had a physical culture, there's no such thing as fat loss being needed. It, it just it, it, it's something that is so specific to a country that had gut, has gutted its, its physical education programs that is always pushing a pill uh you know a potion um a gimmick a scam um you know and then always rallying around celebrity like what do i what do i follow well, oh, okay oprah peloton's like we just got to get on oprah we got to get these celebrity endorsements and we'll become the next big thing and they have but they're just going to – the moment they see the writing on the wall, and I think they have, they're going to cash out. And by the way, like, they are like – what they're putting their instructors through is peer abuse. To have to do like 8 to 12 live one-hour workouts, like and they're doing treadmill shit too. Can you imagine sprinting on the treadmill, talking? Doing, like it's not the instructors that, that, that piss me off. Like everyone's got to make a living. But like – they're putting them through like an ab like downright abusive level of exercise um, to be on this platform. And at the end of the day, it's not their content. And the moment that they can find someone better, they need to replace someone just like at ESPN. 
They'll just drop you because they think they can they can continue on the legacy of ESPN. But no, people are watching ESPN because of the personalities. Make no mistake, like these are the people that actually bring the money in, the, the, the talent. Okay, it's the talent that bring the money in, and these brands can then they can only they can only get away for so long by abusing talent, exploiting talent. At the end of the day, they're just going to cash out anyway the moment they know they can maximize their profits. And they're going to fuck everyone else in the process. So, again, um, stay away from big fitness. And uh, I'm really upset about big marinara now. But let's talk about Ozempic. Like, I know we all, I know we both have individual thoughts on it. You lead us on this, this, this discussion because it, it's all people are talking about. And in a lot of ways, it also sums up everything that's wrong with fitness in the same regard. It's probably the only solution for the average person in this country. Yeah, like and most people are familiar, stomach glutide or Ozempic, depending on the, the brand names of, of what, you know, you're looking at. I had a, a doctor on like a week, maybe a week ago or two weeks ago, he was on here and him and I chatted about it a little bit. Obviously, we've seen numerous people on it uh, in person. It's tough, man, uh, because I do think there's probably people that it's probably their only option if they're 400 pounds and it's like a kickstart for them. And I guess if, if that was the thing that helped them get the ball rolling to make some sustainable lifestyle changes, I can get down with that, I guess, but not to become dependent on it and have that be like the only thing that we're doing. And I think there's a lot of people who it just becomes, well, I'm not going to change any of the other habits. I'm going to take this, have the side effect be like, I'm, I'm nauseous and don't feel good. So by that point, I'm not really going to eat and drink, you know, as much as I typically do. And I'll just get smaller and I'll lose weight. Now, when you lose weight, um, and from what I've read, it doesn't affect metabolism um, at all. I don't think someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't seen anything where it said it actually affects your metabolism. So you'll lose weight for sure. But if the underlying nutrition's not there, if there isn't some kind of training protocol that's there, you'll lose muscle um, as well. Um, I'm assuming you lose like connective tissue and a lot of these important things that you need, especially as you age in life. If you're a woman specifically, and, you're, and, and dudes too, because if you're a dude and you're over 40, how much muscle are you really gonna build, dude? You know, like I'm not saying you can't, but it's extremely hard to do. And once it withers away, are you gonna get it back? And, and for females, it obviously is even harder. So that's the part where it's like, I guess it, in some certain instances, like it's going to be helpful and it will help people. And, and I'm, I guess, a fan of that. But then there's people who take it who probably just had like 10 pounds to lose. And now they keep taking it and they've lost 20 pounds now. And they like being skinny or thin and their face becomes almost like gone and thin because all of the fat in their face is now dissipated. And as you age, you lose collagen and all these other important things. So. We, I've seen it a lot. Um, I live in Scottsdale, so it's like a mini LA kind of. People really give a shit what they look like, which is fine. But I think a lot of people are abusing it um, that don't need it. I don't know what the long-term effects are. If you want to, again, it's your body, it's your life. Do whatever you think is best for you. But just know like all the, the weight that you lose is not is not garbage weight by any means. Yeah, man, look, you want to lose weight, get on Ozempic. You want to be fit, you got to do fit shit. Here's the thing. Like, we live in a society, okay, what, what is someone going to do when they're 40, they're, they're 35, 40 years old and almost 50% body fat, and they know nothing about their body? What can they do? They, can, they can't do anything. Like, the only chance is a pill. And you know what? Frankly, it's surprising that they haven't really found the solution uh, until now, like um, we have no people have no idea how to use their bodies and people like exercise really shouldn't be necessary. We, we both watch the, the Blue Zones thing on Netflix and the societies that live the longest move. It, it, it's movement. It's not exercise. Movement is just baked into their day. They do shit with their hands. They're constantly walking to places. You know, they're just they're getting down on the ground gardening so they don't have to worry about their squat mobility or they actually sit on the floor. 
and the mobility is just built in. Like it's it's all baked into what they do. And again, like a lot of people listening, they have goals bigger than just health. And and that's kind of what fitness is. Fitness is like, okay, let's get specific about it. Let's let's get good at pull-ups or let's run, learn how to run a mile under under six minutes, whatever it is, right? Which is great. These are all great things, but these are things that should never have been necessary. Like if you grow up learning about your body, you just you want to you want to do these things so they make you feel good and it's something that you know how to do so but and again it's not just weight loss right i mean i'm blown away man personally by like how many hymns commercials i get hit with like the, the other day uh when i when i turned 41 so, uh, someone messaged me and said uh what's it like to be 41 and i said my dick has never been harder <laughs> I thought that I was going to be 41 because just like I, that I wouldn't, there would be a problem for me. But honestly, it couldn't be further from the truth. Sometimes I, I cannot believe I have this level of sex drive at this age. And I think a lot of it is I have, I have polygamous DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, my grandpa had four wives. Okay. So I, that's part of the issue too. But a, a lot of it is like, you know, you know, I know this. I had I had actually trouble with with this when I was younger because I was so stressed out. I was starving myself. I was over exercising, and now because I've got wisdom and intelligence about it, I'm not, I'm not saying by the way that some people don't need a pill for their erectile dysfunction. But we live in an age right now. No one wants to fucking take personal accountability. You want to just keep taking pills, like so you're going to take a pill for ED. You're going to take a pill for weight loss. You're going to take a pill to deal with uh, your inability to focus. Okay, like. Pick one, but then you got to like do some actual hard work on some of the others. Unless you want to be someone that takes pills for all of your fucking problems. And that's where we are right now. Insta, microwave society. So you're telling me like it blows my fucking mind that, I mean, I'll, I want you to speak to this as well. Because again, it's it's not just Ozempic. It's just like, what what is happening? Like you got to figure out, like you got to ask yourself, what do you want to be? And again, there are some people I believe Ozempic is probably the only option because things have gone. They've just gotten too far. Like once you get to a level, like, again, we're not doctors. I don't want to speak about it medically. Okay. But this Ozempic's whole thing is supposed to help with glucose metabolism. All right. Blood sugar management, which is a big reason people get so fat and get diabetic and get metabolic syndrome. It also completely takes away your appetite. Um, but you know what else takes away your appetite? Regular movements, eating a diet that focuses on protein and produce, getting enough water, sleeping enough, trying to learn how to manage your stress. And also like just having an actual conversation like about, okay, I'm starting to eat like an asshole here. I'm eating like an asshole. If I'm going to do, if I'm going to eat this, I got to do this just because I can't just be such an asshole about this. All right. Um, I know it's a little bit of a rant, but like, honestly, I'm like, how many pills can we take? Well, you got to be your own health advocate too, with all these things. And you have to kind of look into, you know, what's, what's best for you and what things can you control and what things are out of your control. And I think a lot of times people just accept, Hey, this is just how I am. And this is how it's going to be. And there's no, fight to try to change it uh on a behavioral level and just daily practice of things and to your point like fitness is a is a luxury that a lot of people don't have and like in a lot of countries it doesn't exist obviously in america it does it's it's a major business but that's recent like we didn't have this many gyms and offerings and apps and education 40 years ago yet we're way unhealthier now were years ago now there's a there's on there the top one percent are here for sure but everything else like man like we a cliff and so it it can't be just to take this and it will fix everything it doesn't you might take ozempic or you know something to, to lose weight but it doesn't fix your endurance to fix your mobility uh it's your strength fix the other eight problems that have come down the road you might not be quote unquote like overweight but there's a million types i mean not a million there's multiple types of fat you can have on the body some are better than others but it doesn't improve overall heart health and the things that actually have to be functional and move and it just seems like 
for a lot of people, it's it's the easy way out, at least up front. I don't know the trade off of it as it goes. Um, again, I never know. I've, I've known anybody who's taken it for 10 years. Um, but I wouldn't want, again, if, if the side effect was, hey, it's going to make you feel nauseous every day, that's not something I would like to do. I guess I would rather just walk around and move. And to your point, that's if you do watch Blue Zones or anything similar to that, it's just, it's overall movement. And I understand how hard it is when people get busy with jobs and kids and travel. It's a commitment for sure. Because today we worked out. I have work shit to do. It's like, what time is it here? Like one o'clock. Um, I've already gotten 10,000 steps in, but I, after I worked out, I had to put on a rock and walk around for basically a fucking hour or damn near to get my 10, 11,000 steps for the day. Now that's a daily commitment that I make, but I have to do it. And if I don't, I tend to feel like shit. And I know even if I quote unquote worked out, that's not enough movement for the day, depending on even, even what the workout was. If I worked out for 30 minutes or 42 minutes or whatever it, it ends up being, that's not enough movement for my entire day versus me just sitting or laying and doing nothing. And that's something that people just have to commit to. But for a lot of people, they're not willing to give up, you know, Netflix or football or whatever it is. Let me just take a pill and it'll solve all my problems. And it might in the short term, but long term, I think you're missing so many things by not moving around and not just an advocate for your own health and like looking at like what what the problem is how did i get here and yeah maybe i can take help me but if you don't do all the other things it feels like it's just a waste with all the other risks of whatever side effects it may bring look, look man you know like oh man and by the way like it doesn't make you a bad person if you take ozempic okay i don't blame you i blame society this is what happens you don't teach people how to eat you don't teach people how to move and you create a dog moron exercise that it has to be miserable and painful and you got to be in, you got to be sore you got to be screaming like we've done this to ourselves okay and we have no leadership in this space and we we've, we've given people always a pill or a quick fix to solve these systemic problems that unfortunately for some people it's just they're too far gone it's really tough to learn how to use your body when you're over 35, especially when you're over 100 pounds overweight, and especially when we make the best foods so expensive that even rich people can't buy some of them now. Like Deborah middle class has been like pushed away from it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like we've done this to ourselves. So society has fucked us and they're not, they're not, they're not going to be there for us. You've got to take control of your life. And by the way, what's so crazy about this too, and this is like part of why sometimes I'm like, you know, like we give people workouts, right? And in a traditional sense, like it's 10 minutes.